It was a fateful afternoon on July 26th, 2015. I had never seen The Muppet Christmas Carol, but I had heard it was a pretty good film. But it was on that day that I decided to hold off on watching it. The reason being a video from Cat Icarus titled That Cheesy Bastard. If you haven't seen this video, believe me, it's as big of a tangent as it sounds. Let's take a listen. They cut out one of the most important and integral scenes of that movie that not only is completely heartbreaking, naturally explains the turning point of Scrooge's character as to why he is the way he is in the present, and has a song that is even reprised at the end of the movie to resolve not only Scrooge's character but the entire central theme of the story, but the theatrical VHS and Laserdisc versions of that film had it in there. This very crucial scene, and everything afterwards had it cut out. Side note, a few of those details are a little inaccurate accurate, check the description if you want to know what I mean. But from that point on, I was a little reluctant to watch what was apparently an incomplete movie, and figured I'd probably wait until a more definitive version came along. And that time has finally come, because on December 9th, 2022, a full-length version of the movie was released on Disney+. Plus. A fact that I'm sure would make Caddy so excited he could burst into song. With a thankful heart, with an endless joy. So after spending seven years refusing to watch a movie because two minutes were cut, I thought I'd at long last give it a watch and see what I thought of it as a whole. So the first thing I'd like to mention is that Disney really did not do a good job of conveying that this full version was getting released. There was little to no marketing for it as far as I'm aware, and even looking on Disney Plus you have to do some digging to find it. Look in the extras menu and you'll find the option there. It really just strikes me as a bad decision that the complete cut of the movie is tucked away in a menu, which, let's be honest, most people are not going to bother looking through. But whatever, we know now, so I guess I'll take it. I'll discuss what I think of the scene that was cut when I get to it, but for now, let's take a look at the movie in general. The main thing that surprised me about this movie was the tone. Despite it being a Muppets movie, it actually wasn't as funny as I was expecting. And by that, I don't mean that the film fails to be funny, I mean that it actually plays the story fairly seriously for the most part, which is something I'm kind of in two minds about, but I'll explain what I like about it first. I have to give the movie credit for actually attempting to tell the story sincerely and earnestly, instead of just using the source material as background fodder while the characters do stand-up for 90 minutes. <laughs> Scrooge himself is characterized in a suitably miserable way, and they don't shy away from demonstrating how much of a negative effect he has on the lives of the people around him. They show how his employees are intimidated by him and work under the bare minimum of comfort. How does one celebrate Christmas on the unemployment line? and how so many people are living in poverty because of how much money he takes from them. And even in the one instance early on when he finally shows a bit of generosity by giving his staff the day off, he still has to be talked into it by Bob Cratchit, played by Kermit the Frog, played by Steve Whitmire, telling him what he stands to gain from it. Why open the office tomorrow? Other businesses will be closed, you'll have no one to do business with. He goes on the typical Ebenezer Scrooge character arc of being shown Christmas past, present, and future, learning to appreciate Christmas, and again, it's treated pretty seriously. His Christmas past, for example, shows a pretty natural progression to how he got to his grumpy and bitter state in the present. When the ghost of Christmas past arrives, we first see him as a child at school where he seems fairly innocent, albeit not the most social kid, preferring to spend his spare time working. <laughs> Christmas. This is where the initial seed is planted in terms of his later obsession with business, especially after the encouragement to work even harder from his school teacher, played by Sam Eagle, played by Frank Oz. We then see him as a young man working for a businessman Fozziewig, played by Oh I See What You Did There, played by Frank Oz. Here we see his greed is starting to consume him. He's at this big office party where everyone's having a good time and all he can think about is the company's finances. Do you know how much the firm is spending for this party? Although at the party he's introduced to someone who it seems might convince him to lighten up, a woman he'd grow to love named Belle. By all accounts it seems like he's found something for his humanity to cling to, but it wouldn't be a Christmas carol if it worked out that way in the long run. A few years go by and he's unwilling to commit to her over his money. She leaves him, severing the last link he had to his more caring side, leading to him becoming a more disgruntled old man who only values money because it's all he ever learned to value. It does a good job of showing how Scrooge went from a hard-working boy to a man who cared about his work and work only. And when Scrooge looks back on it all, he finally realizes that Belle was the most fulfilling part of his life. 
and this realization leaves him in complete and utter despair as he thinks about how he threw away everything in his life that actually mattered. But this in turn leaves him in the best state possible for a redemption. Now that he's lost faith in his money, he's a little more open-minded to find faith in something else. And so he's shown the level of happiness that Christmas can bring out in a person. But Christmas present still isn't entirely ideal, as Scrooge's treatment of everyone around him has only resulted in everyone else despising him, from the townsfolk to his employees to even his own family. An unwanted creature, but not a rattleech or a cockroach. It's Ebenezer Scrooge! Yes! And this fact only gets more painful when Scrooge takes a look at Christmas yet to come. At this point, Scrooge has passed away and isn't mourned by anyone. In fact, everyone is just happy to be rid of him. Wonder what he died of. Mm. I thought he'd never go. <laughs> and this is the final turning point for Scrooge as a character. He finally realizes just how much of a waste and a burden his life has been on everyone around him, but also knows what he can do to change it. He wakes up the next morning and starts making peace with everyone in the entire town, spending his money on presents for all of them. Something he wouldn't have dared to do just one day ago. Two moments in particular stand out to me as being particularly nice here. The first being this scene where Scrooge meets two charity collectors that he previously turned away, played by Dr. Bunsen Honeydew and Beaker, played by Dave Goles and Steve Whitmire. Okay, this joke is getting more convoluted than I was intending, I'll stop now. This is the door, you may use it. And gives them a sizable donation. And in turn, Beaker gives him his scarf as a Christmas present. A gift? A gift for me? Now, to someone as wealthy as Scrooge, a scarf on its own likely wouldn't mean much, but to receive it as a gift from someone as an act of goodwill, you can tell he's genuinely touched. And the second moment I love is when he goes to make amends with Bob Cratchit. Initially, he pretends to be as mean as ever, seeming like he's about to fire him for not being at work. You, sir, were not at work this morning as we had discussed. Before revealing that he plans to raise his salary and pay off his mortgage. Merry Christmas. This scene does a great job of demonstrating the growth that Scrooge has had, not only because he's now willing to help out Bob Cratchit, but he's doing it in such a playful way by essentially putting on a show and surprising him. It also shows how much he's moved on from his old self, and the fact that he's now willing to make fun of the man that he used to be. It's Christmas Day, you gave me the day off. I, Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> Would I do a thing like that? Admittedly, Michael Caine's performance is something I have slightly mixed feelings on. My main problem is that there are a number of scenes where his line deliveries just sound like he's reading from the script, and other times where he just looks like he's bored. I don't want to say he was necessarily phoning it in, since there are a number of factors that could affect his performance, but it's a problem that comes up often enough to be distracting. And Edmund, my best friend. Hello, boys. Hello? But to his credit, when it comes to the moments that really count, he pulls it off. The early scenes where he needs to act cold and bitter do come across pretty well, and he also manages to sell the more emotional moments too. The scenes where he has to act happy, and especially the crying scenes, all feel really genuine. So for the most part, I think he does a pretty good job. But while I like that the film has a slightly more dramatic tone than what you might expect, I still would have appreciated if there was more comedy. I mean, it's the Muppets, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect. Comedy and sentimentality are not mutually exclusive, they can coexist. It's a difficult balance, but it can be done. But while the comedy isn't as much of a focus as it arguably should be, the presence of the Muppets still has a positive effect on the overall movie. For a retelling of a story that's been retold and retold, they use the style of the Muppets to tell it in their own universe unique way. As you'd expect from the Muppets, the puppets and puppeteering work are really top notch. They're really expressive and their movement looks very lifelike. They even manage to include a few full body shots, which I imagine must have been tricky to pull off, but they make it work really well. Admittedly, I'm not a fan of the puppet used for the Ghost of Christmas Past though. It looks like it's half trying to look realistic and half trying to look cartoonish and it just ends up looking uncanny. Thankfully though, the rest of the character designs look a lot better, like the Ghost of Christmas Present for example. This guy is actually a person in a suit with an animatronic head instead of a puppet, which works really well considering he's meant to be a giant, so it helps that he's depicted in a way where he's actually measuring up to the human characters. Plus, unlike the Ghost of Christmas Past, this design fully commits to the cartoonish art style and he looks a lot more appealing and expressive as a result. And the design for the Ghost of Christmas yet to come is honestly incredible. He's really dark and creepy looking. 
this time intentionally. To me, this is one of the main advantages of the movie, actually telling the story with some dramatic weight. We get to see awesome designs like this that don't shy away from the scarier elements. The town also has this exaggerated appearance where the buildings all have this old-timey, angular, and cobbled-together look, really taking the look of the time period in the film's own unique direction. As for the songs, they all range anywhere from fine but forgettable to legitimately pretty good. I won't go into all of them, but let's talk about the ones where I actually have something to say. The film the opening song, simply titled Scrooge, manages to capture the tone of the story early on pretty well. It's intimidating to suit Scrooge while also being goofy enough to suit the Muppets. And the worst of the worst, the most hated and cursed, is the one that we call Scrooge. And I like that it's sung by the townsfolk since it establishes the reputation that Scrooge has so that the rest of the film can be spent with him working to redeem himself. We also don't get a clear shot of Scrooge's face during the opening, which helps to establish him as being unfriendly and standoffish. And then we have When Love Was Gone, the scene that was cut from a lot of copies of the film. The song is sung by Belle as she breaks up with Scrooge, and now seeing it for myself, I have to admit that I can kind of understand it being cut to an extent. I don't agree with the decision, but I at least get it. The song has some strong elements, such as when Scrooge starts singing it with her as a duet, once he grows to lament the breakup as much as she did all that time ago, as well as Michael Caine's performance in the scene. But the melody is pretty bland and monotonous. I even checked the other version of the movie with the song cut, and the story still flows fine. I love you, Bill. You did once. All the information that you need to know gets summed up pretty well in the conversation at the beginning of the scene, and we still get to see Scrooge's reaction, so the song isn't hugely important. Sorry, Caddy, but I don't have as big a deal with this as you do. Oh. But all things considered, I did get a lot of enjoyment out of this movie. If you're wondering whether I recommend watching the full-length version after all I just said, I would say you might as well, even if I don't think it's crucial to enjoying the movie as a whole. It's only two minutes longer, so even if you're not as passionate about the scene as Caddy, you don't really have anything to lose. And hey, even if you don't get much out of that scene, you're still getting a pretty good adaptation of A Christmas Carol out of it, so that's nice. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, consider checking out my last video on Avatar. With the sequel released, it's a good time to take a look at how the original holds up. 